name is Andrew Liu. I'm a senior at Gunn. And today, uh, I'm going to be talking to you about student research, what I, I think is our Sputnik moment, student research. Our world is full of unanswered questions. They call out to us, tickle our curiosity, invite us to relentlessly pursue the answers. What makes up the universe? Is there a limit to how much we can extend the human lifespan? Is it even possible to sustain exponential population growth? And how hot exactly will the world become if we allow global warming to worsen? These are hard, really hard questions. And that's exactly what makes them so interesting and real world. They jump around in the collective mind and stir speculations as society finds itself caught between so many possibilities. They motivate that search for answers, that quest that I want to talk to you about today, scientific research. Now, what's so exciting about research is the potential to map out unknown territory, to pave new roads for others to follow. The research today in medicine, computer science, astrophysics, you name it, is indeed cutting edge. But to really see what it means to wander almost blindly into completely new realms, I want to take us back 4,000 years to ancient Egypt, to one of the most ancient mathematical texts of all time, the Rhind Mathematical Papyrus. Now, the Egyptians didn't have many mathematical facts or tools at their disposal. They didn't have the Pythagorean theorem to find distances. They didn't have protractors to measure angles. But they still had to find ways to use math to solve problems like building pyramids and dividing land among families. And one particularly vexing problem was how to calculate the area of a circle without knowing pi r squared. So how do you calculate the area without pi r squared? The Egyptians decided to approximate it with the area of a comparable polygon. But which polygon should we choose? And after we've chosen our shape, what size should we make it? The most difficult thing for the Egyptians was that there was no right answer with which they could compare their approximation because no one had ever done it before. So the Egyptians tried every shape and size um, and every combination, and a lot of them led to dead ends. Uh, but they eventually settled on approximation by octagons. And as documented in the papyrus, they would start with the circle's circumscribing square, trisect each side, and remove the corner triangles. And because they could find the area of the square in these triangles, they could approximate the area of the circle. And they were awfully close, too. They only missed the true value by half a percent. So there you have it, the first known method for computing the area of a circle, and relatively straightforward one discovered through grueling trial and error some 4,000 years ago. Now, I think this example tells us two things. First, it tells us that research is about building new knowledge, uh, taking what's already known and logically and creatively synthesizing it into new conclusions, which then themselves are again synthesized. Just as the Egyptians utilized their knowledge of polygons to approximate circles, the Greeks and other mathematicians would later develop the Egyptians' ideas in a long and gradual process to come up with the formula that we have today. And second, research is about uh, failure. There were a lot of steps between the initial hunch and final product that the Egyptians had to take. They had to try a lot of new things, new shapes, new constructions, new sizes. And many of these attempts did not produce the desired results, but they did learn from their failures. They learned, for instance, it's not a good idea to approximate a circle with a triangle, because it has so few sides. But everything they learned in their failures ultimately became their final success. So these two things, creating new knowledge and confronting failure, they, they define research. They define this ongoing trek into the unknown. And this trek requires the creativity and energy of young people who often become captivated by its challenge. I know I was. In seventh grade, although I can't have pretended to create new knowledge or to have done anything as glorious as the Egyptians, I embarked on my first project when I designed a computer game to teach my classmates about US geography. It was called GeoQuest. Um, and what was so fun for me was not just playing with the computer and writing the game questions in Flash, but the most fun part for me was seeing the buttons grow like balloons when the mouse hovered over them. The reason being because I had spent several days trying to program that in and failed multiple times uh, before accomplishing this result. 
Um, I think I cared more about the buns than actually winning the regional science fair or anything else. But the point is, this project got me excited. Uh, it gave me a taste, and it made me thirsty for more. So the next year, I tried my hand at backyard biogases, completely different. Um, after mixing horse manure and organic rubbish from my kitchen, and I really I poured the pretty smelly concoction into these five water containers and saw, tried to uh, inflate balloons to see if methane could be produced. And every time I checked, the balloons had hardly inflated. Um, being the stubborn eighth grader, I tried everything, adding more manure, exposing the bottle to the light 24-7, but, but nothing worked. Now, I wanted to share with you these two projects, GeoQuest and Biogas, because they gave me my first impressions of those dis defining aspects of research. Um, the first being the joy of creation and discovery, uh, and the second being the frustration of dealing with what's unexpected. And as I proceeded in high school to work at the lab bench or to program, um, whether I was developing algorithms for the Netflix prize or modeling gene networks on the computer, I came to attack research as the most rigorous test of persistence I had ever encountered. So all this previous research laid the groundwork for my latest project, the one that I think has been one of the most rewarding experiences of my life, and the one that I hope will, sh will show you uh, why research is such an exciting and fulfilling pursuit. Now, if you recall at the beginning of this talk, I gave you a list of unanswered questions. And it was a similarly unanswered question that motivated my project. Biology is quickly becoming flooded with data. Um, so entire subfields, from genomics to ecology, have all gone digital. To quote Elizabeth Canisi in the journal Science, a central question now confronting virtually all fields of biology is whether scientists can deduce from this torrent of molecular data how systems and whole organisms work. All this information needs to be sifted, organized, compiled, and most importantly, connected by making biology more quantitative, by relying on mathematics, engineering, and computer science. In particular, the explosion of genomics data regarding diseases from cancer all the way to autoimmune needs to be deciphered. Now imagine, what if we had a method that could take all this data and predict the treatments for any given disease? That method would allow us to discover new treatments from what we already have without spending more time and money, without conducting more experiments, without needing to accumulate more data. That method would quicken the day when patients suffering from so many diseases could live fuller lives and enter the decade-old field of pathway analysis whose goal is exactly to develop this method. Now, pathway analysis has progressed toward this ideal method ever since its inception. Three generations have each added their own little complexities and sophistications to methods that are continually being refined. The first, most primitive generation just counted the number of genes to determine significant pathways. The second added in how genes interacted with each other, and the third also accounted for the structure of pathways. Yet, none of the previous techniques has been able to accurately analyze these masses of data at a holistic systems biology level. That is, not until now. Enter my project, in which I account for yet another complexity, how pathways interact with each other. Suddenly, things change dramatically. While the existing techniques would analyze each pathway individually and then often predict the wrong treatments, my method integrates these pathways into a network and then subsequently identifies the most biologically relevant pathways and even reveals a new treatment for transplant rejection. And here's the most exciting part. When my proposed treatment is tested biologically in mouse model, it works to reduce rejection. And not only significantly, but in some extent, it's even more effective than the current standard of care drugs that doctors administer to their patients. In transplant rejection, I see just one example of the potential for my method to improve quality of life. Just like transplant rejection, there are many other diseases with data waiting to be analyzed and with treatments waiting to be discovered. Standing on the edge of knowledge, making a contribution to society, this, this is what makes research so exciting. And what makes it all sweeter is the failures that became my final success, trying multiple times to 
store all of this pathway data and integrate it into a network, or trying to quantify in a numerical formula how important a biological interaction is, or proposing and testing hypothesis after hypothesis regarding the mechanisms behind rejection. Th this is what makes research so exciting. And for my generation, for you high school students in the audience, I believe that now is the time to give it a try. You have the malleable minds, the energy, the optimism, and most importantly, the freedom to fail. I urge you to take a risk and wander into uncharted territory because the rewards you may find may be beyond your wildest dreams. If you've ever wondered how you could ever apply that classroom knowledge you learned in physics, that those optics or the genomics you covered in biology, research is for you. If you've ever desired a challenge into which you could pour all of your heart and soul, something that wouldn't just come to you without struggle, research is for you. If you've ever w been lost for a purpose or wondered how to make an impact on this world, research could be for you. And if you've ever dreamed of owning something immortal, a piece of knowledge, if you've ever dreamed of seeing your name in the textbooks of the future, research is definitely for you. And don't just take my word for it. I have President Obama on my side. In his 2011 State of the Union address, he said, it's not just the winner of the Super Bowl who deserves to be celebrated, but the winner of the science fair. Also, he is literally on my side. That's me trying to put my head closer to his um, so I can make it my Facebook profile picture. Um, <laughs> but um, so even if everything uh, I've discussed with you about satisfying your intellectual curiosity or overcoming challenge or making a contribution to society or even owning a piece of knowledge hasn't convinced you that research is so great, you would also have the opportunity to meet the President of the United States. Okay, all joking aside, there's a reason why President Obama is paying more attention to young scientists than any previous administration. There's a reason why companies like Siemens and Intel and organizations like the US military are going out of their way, increasing their support for high school research to unprecedented levels at millions of dollars. It's because on top of all the personal fulfillment you will find in research, society needs you. The upcoming challenges, climate change, energy crisis, the water crisis, they are the biggest. And the shortage of young scientists is the most profound. There's a void to be filled and a challenge to be conquered. So for the students, I urge you to take a chance and immerse yourself in the world of research, and you may find something that fulfills you for the rest of your life. For the educators in our schools and the mentors in our communities, I urge you to foster the spirit of scientific exploration as with physical resources, with guidance, with inspiration. And for the rest of the American public, I urge you to celebrate this pursuit of science as it contains many of the answers to many of our problems. Because as Obama put it, this is our generation's Sputnik moment. This is the time to shine. Let's make it happen. Thank you. <laughs>